Anyway, enough um, waffling on from me. It is um, a great pleasure to welcome, well, um, first of all, welcome to the various members of different clubs that have joined us on the virtual. That's the beauty of this, that we can, uh, we can all join from all over the place. So welcome to all of you. And uh, especially a very warm welcome to Duncan James, M0OTG, who has very kindly offered to um, join us and uh, talk to us about the transistor and uh, how that uh, has changed the way uh, radios work. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this and um, with a, um, I'm afraid it doesn't work very well on Zoom, but um, a hearty round of applause uh, from Radark. Uh, and a welcome. So I hand over to you, Duncan. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I'm always nervous about getting uh, getting applause before I've done this stuff. So, uh, uh, but I, I'll be watching the. We've got 29 participants. So uh, if it doesn't drop to one, um, then I'll uh, consider it. Uh, it, uh, it it's worked. Um, yeah, th thanks for the invite. It's it's. Uh, I don't talk very much ab ab about radio. Um, my main uh, the main work I do as as an architectural historian means that I talk about buildings and uh, I specialise in the analysis of timber frame buildings in particular. So that's my speciality, which is a long way from electronics, um, as you can imagine. Um, What's, uh, what's intriguing, uh, I, I took the opportunity to, opportunity to have a look at uh, your website uh, last night, and I found that my father, G6NW, was actually a member way back in, well, in your list of 1934, five, uh, my father's name turns up there, uh, which is, um, which is quite extraordinary. I just had no idea at all. He was living at Abingdon at the time, and that's when Berkshire, uh, when Abingdon was in Berkshire, rather than it hadn't been stolen by Oxfordshire. So, uh, um, so that's obviously why he uh, he joined you. I, <laughs> quite astonished, uh, uh, amazing. Um, now, when I was um, when I was a lad, um, uh, transistors were new. Um, they were a new fangled device that had arrived. They were fiendishly expensive. I seem to remember 15 shillings of my pocket money to buy one of them. Um, and uh, so I got a lot of experience of looking at valved equipment. Uh, and I particularly liked the, uh, the, the little uh, battery powered radios with their tiny valves and direct uh, direct filaments, um, direct cathodes, which uh, which I thought were were lovely, and they seem to work beautifully. Um, so I was fascinated by electronics, but uh, moved away from it in later life. Returning relatively recently, um, having got my uh, my full license. So it's um, it's an intriguing subject, and I think uh, radios not only are they fascinating. Uh, uh, in the way they work, but they're also rather beautiful objects, um, especially when you open them up and have a look inside. Um, it, it, they are a, a, a deeply fascinating subject. Um, so let's uh, let's have a, a, a go at sharing a screen and getting this um, this thing cranked up. Uh, does that do it? Let's see. Yes. How's that? Is that uh, are we are we? Um, uh, we can't see a screen yet, Duncan. Can't see a screen yet. Okay. Don't panic. Uh, there we go. It's starting up now. We're away, are we? Okay. That's uh, that's yep, great. Yeah, we see it. Uh, marvelous. Okay. Well, there we are. Um, right. Um, I'm going to actually use a script. I don't normally use a script with my uh, with my talks. Um, but then if I'm talking about buildings, uh, I, you you can tend tend to be able to talk to the uh, talk to the picture very much more easily than you can with uh, with with radio. Um, there are there have been many changes in the man made world over the last century. 
but there are a few that have had such a profound effect on each and every one of us as the advances that have been made in electronics, as you will all know. The evidence is there in every smartphone, which is a, a miracle of miniaturization that's now the constant companion, or so it seems, of everyone on the planet. At its heart is a computer of staggering complexity in terms of its microscopic hardware, which has evolved from the invention, the, the invention of the transistor junction in the late 1940s. This was followed in the 1950s by a race to bring reliable devices to the market for many applications, including portable radios, where the small size coupled with low voltage and power requirements were key advantages over the use of the thermionic valve. For many young radio amateurs, the valve with its high anode and going cathode is a thing of the past. It's associated now with bulky equipment burdened with heavy transformers and where the receivers or transmitters a tendency to drift in frequency as everything warms up. Recently, the valve has been dropped. I, I, when I wrote that, I thought that sounds rather odd. Recently, the valve has been dropped from the amateur radio exam curriculum because there are no longer, they are no longer used in modern amateur radio equipment. There are a few exceptions, as I'm sure you know. The transistor in its many configurations has taken its place. Although they are, there are some of us who still enjoy using transmitters and receivers that are built around the glow of the incandescent valve. And there's, a, I love this picture. Isn't it great? I love, to, I love the way the, um, uh, the, the, the shelves are groaning. Um, you can almost hear the, the creaking as, uh, as the uh, weight is taken. But anyway, there's a nice, uh, a nice bunch of, uh, uh, obviously, lo lots of AM stuff. Um, really very nice indeed. And I love this one. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think his wife must be an amateur as well. I would suggest that W9UA is, is the wife standing there behind him. But uh, he's in command, obviously, um, as, uh, as we can see. Well, the valve may be a thing of the past, but for many of us, it's, a, it's far from forgotten. In its final form, it had reached a peak of functionality and in some cases complexity, such that one might wonder what further potential it could have had if the invention and rapid development of the semiconductor had not undermined its dominant position. Um, I should say that I spent a lot of my life designing and making jewellery, and I always consider the interior of some of these valves to be really remarkably beautiful and, and, and exquisitely made. Uh, and um, I'm always tempted to, to, to break the glass so that I can see inside, but uh, I don't do that. I don't do that. The problem with valves was very often getting, uh, getting them to work at a higher frequency and the little acorn valve, um, for instance, and I remember making a few things using acorn valves uh, when I was a kid. Um, and uh, this is one of them, little side contacts and uh, uh, guaranteed to work at a, a pretty high frequency. But by the time the transistor was invented, the valve had been through 50 years of development to become a, a sophisticated device with a complex internal structure. It had also been miniaturized for military use and for hearing aids. And here are some of the, the, the hearing aid type of, um, of valve. Uh, I remember many years ago getting hold of a, a hearing aid. It was in black a black box uh, and it was really um, a, a very unattractive thing um, and I think it was pre-war or just about some maybe 1940s and it used tiny valves like this and believe me the quality of reproduction was absolutely superb um, and I remember being astonished at how well it worked. Um, I, I wish I had it now, it's, uh, it was a lovely thing. In America, in 1939, the RCA company produced a very small portable superhead receiver, the RCA Victor BP-10, and here it is. Um, 
they packed into here four little valves, a complete super head circuit, high voltage uh, uh, battery and uh, a one and a half volt battery for the filaments. And as you can see, it's crammed into a very small space. The valves used were the IR5, IT4, IS5 and IS4. And the radio was so popular that in just two years, over 200,000 were sold. And it, that was until the bombing of Pearl Harbor brought America into the war and production had to stop. Although the miniature valves did find a use in military communications equipment. Similar designs of similar size were produced in the UK. There's another view of the, the RCA Victor, um, beautifully packed in and uh, uh, I'd love to see how how well it worked, but uh, ball bearings on the uh, on the the uh, capacitor on the variable capacitor and a tiny loudspeaker, which would have been pretty unusual for the for the time. This is uh, this is a British attempt, uh, the Ever Ready Model B. Um, uh, you can see that it's a metal case actually, but the, the lid has got, uh, instead of using a ferrite rod aerial, it, it, uh, it has a winding within the plastic lid uh, for, for the receiver. This one is medium wave only, um, and I think we can see the interior. There's the interior, plenty of room for the batteries, of course, and again, packed in very tightly, uh, very neatly made. Um, the EverReady radio measured a, a mere nine and a half inches and was just two inches thick, which was smaller than many of the transistor radios that would enter the market 10 years later. They had a plastic case, but the chassis was metal. The valves used, which were essentially equivalent to the RCA series, were DK91, a heptode, DF91, a pentode, DAF91 diode pentode and DL91 a pentode for, for the output uh, circuit. The EverReady models were manufactured by Plessy. It's very interesting to see how some of these little radios, the companies uh, producing them, and we associate Plessy with high quality military equipment, but uh, they certainly had their hand in producing uh, uh, the, uh, the, the more uh, uh, household staff. Um, it was a disadvantage, of course, uh, that there was no provision for long wave uh, reception, um, which for the British listener would have meant missing out on the BBC light programme, which was then broadcast on 200 kilohertz. This one that, in, that I'm showing is a, is a little Marconi P20B. Um, it's a, a, again a, an incredibly neat little uh, device um, with a, an opening lid, of course, which uh, um, then turns on the, the radio, if I remember rightly. I can't remember whether, I think this one, yes, it does. It turns, it turns the radio on and uh, of course it has the aerial inside and we can look inside again, packed in. Um, this is a die cast metal case. Uh, and a somewhat bigger speaker than the American one that we saw just now, and um, and, and beautifully made. I mean, they really are a, a, a joy, uh, the, the interior, a really uh, miniature job. And this offered medium and long wave reception with a wave change switch on the, on the front panel. And usually the metal case was die cast with a, with a mock snakeskin finish, uh, really very sophisticated. Um, but the base and the lid were, were of course, plastic. Uh, it had a very modern look, this one, um, and it clearly was intended for uh, the ladies because it's a rather attractive little, uh, you could imagine it on dr a dressing table uh, rather than uh, in, in a workshop. And here's the circuit diagram. Um, many of you, uh, I'm sure all of you will be able to read this quite happily, but uh, uh, I sometimes think there are a few, Fewer and fewer people. Um, if you're if you're if you've been brought up on transistors, this might well be alien territory. Um, but here's a little switch here, which gives you medium and long wave uh, by shorting out this uh, this part of the circuit. Uh, we have um, uh, fed into the signal, fed into the grid, uh, amplified um, into the intermediate into the uh, uh, the IF transformer. And this side is the circuitry for the, uh, for the um, oscillator 
uh, feeding the signal also into this valve. So it works as a mixer as well. So it's doing lots of, uh, lots of things at once. Um, and we feed into the next valve, uh, into the grid, uh, through to the next IF transformer. And, uh, and then we're on here, we've got a volume control. Interestingly enough, um, the signal is fed through here into the diode here. Um, so it's, uh, it's demodulated and, uh, and then fed, uh, amplified up here uh, and into the final uh, valve into the uh, output transformer. So uh, all, all very nice stuff. Um, so um, this, uh, this has an intermediate frequency of, uh, of 365 uh, uh, kilohertz, which is, which is lower than, the, uh, than, than one would normally expect. Um, it's only in the late 1940s that these small valves found their way into British portable radios, and so began a decade or so of their use in battery-hungry radio sets before they were eclipsed by the new, increasingly reliable transistor radios of the 1960s. Because these valve portables needed power to heat the valve filaments and supply the high tension voltage, either 69 volts or 90 volts, uh, they were heavily dependent on specially manufactured batteries, which explains why the majority of portable radios of the period were produced by or for the battery makers such as EverReady and Vidor or Vidor. Um, here's a Roberts RMB uh, design. Uh, we can take a pretty traditional arrangement and we can take a peek inside, lots of space in here, uh, four valves, standard sort of uh, arrangement. But this is long, medium and short wave, unusually, uh, and uh, mains as well. So it's, uh, it's working in, uh, in both ways. It's uh, described as a portable, but if you put the batteries in this, um, it makes it quite a weight, so uh, uh, limited portability. The frame aerial in this was within the radio case, uh, in spite of the uh, uh, in spite of there being a lot of metalwork inside. In fact, it's under this uh, this this frame running around here, and uh, here are the connections for the uh, antenna. This is another example, the final one I'm going to show you of these, uh, this delay before we get to transistors um, is, the, is the, one of the, the, the battery maker, Vidor or Vidor. Um, this is called the Lady Margaret. Uh, and it's obviously was produced in, it was produced in 1954 and it was aimed at the rising spending power of women in the post-war years. Um, Vidor, they, they called it a personal attache battery portable, which, uh, which I think is lovely. Um, but uh, what's, uh, what's intriguing about this is the interior. Uh, there we are. Again, the standard arrangement um, with, uh, with four valves tucked in there, uh, tag strip wiring as well. So uh, uh, a little bit out of date and, and batteries, uh, batteries tucked in there. Um, but the secret of this one, this was using a new series of miniature valves, um, which were the same size and specification as the RCA valves, um, but they had the important difference of, of having uh, one and a half volt filaments that operated at half the current levels of the earlier types. And this was a valuable improvement that gave a much longer battery life. And the set had long and medium wave reception, frame aerial in the lid, attractive design, and a, a generous size of uh, loudspeaker. So uh, um, in fact, there's the rolled up piece of paper helping to secure the batteries is from the Daily Mirror, April 8th, 1957, which, uh, which does uh, say something, I think. Um, so um, this is 1954 um, that this was uh, manufactured. And this is just before transistor sets come into the British market and the British radios. Um, so this is the last of a line, very much so.
Although the valve was still king at the start of the 1950s, it was about to be dethroned by the arrival of the transistor. There was a multitude of factors driving the transition from valve to transistor, not least of which was the small size of the new arrival, its low power consumption and the future promise of improved reliability. But there were hurdles. From the first experimental example shown here, made in 1947 at the Bell Laboratories, there was the challenge of producing a practical device with known parameters, then scaling things up to manufacture it in useful quantities. The earliest examples were expensive, and this was for a short while a barrier to their wider adoption. But as the cost fell and there was a greater consistency in the quality and operating characteristics of the product, the transistor soon found its way into many areas that hitherto had been the domain of the thermionic valve. The first news of a working transistor came in a short paper published some six months after the actual discovery in the Physical Review of July 1948. And this was by John Bardeen and Walter Brattain of the Bell Telephone Laboratories. It was headed, The Transistor, a Semiconductor Triode. I love that, a Semiconductor Triode, which is indeed what it was, and opened with a brief description which indicates that the authors realized the importance of their discovery. They described it as a three element electronic device which utilizes a newly discovered principle involving a semiconductor as the basic element. It may be employed as an amplifier, oscillator, and for other purposes for which vacuum tubes are norm uh, ordinarily used. The device consists of three electrodes placed on a block of germanium. So um, these are the, uh, this, is, uh, this is John Bardeen and Walter Brattain on each side with William Shockley in the middle. And uh, those of you who have read about the origins of the transistor will know that William Shockley was uh, actually a key figure in all this, um, but a very difficult man to work with. And uh, um, it's very interesting uh, to, to read about the relationship uh, between these uh, three men, although they did win the Nobel Prize in 1956. It was a, a, a joint winning, winner, wi winning um, and they, all, they each got a third of the, uh, of the proceeds, as far as I can gather. Um, in the concluding paragraph of the paper about this new discovery, William Shockley's contribution was noticed, noted almost as an afterthought, although Shockley was a key player in the discovery. He did, he, Shockley did end up by having rather extreme political views, which um, didn't uh, help, his, uh, uh, help his career, as far as I can gather. Um, the, they, uh, they wrote in their paper, we wish to acknowledge our de debt to W. Shockley for initiating and directing the research program that led to the discovery on which this development is based. Um, and we can just see, it's interesting to look at the, the construction. Um, the experimental prototype survives. It achieved a very close spacing between the two contact points by fixing a narrow strip of gold foil around the lower edge of a triangular piece of perspex, and then with a scalpel cutting a tiny gap in the strip where it was then pressed into a small slab of germanium which formed the base. A spring made from a bent paper clip was used to press the contacts down on the germanium. So a, a very crude uh, a, arrangement, um, but it did work. Um, and of course, this is the, the point contact uh, transistor. It's clear from the journals of the period that there was scant appreciation of the public to the by the public of the sweeping changes that the transistor would bring as it moved from germanium into silicone and from single discrete devices into the miniaturization of both junctions components and the interconnections that go into the production of integrated circuits but behind the scenes those working on the theoretical side of electronics soon picked up on the significance of the semiconductor triode 
And there were those who appreciated what the switching properties of the transistor might offer in the development of the electronic computer, in which valves presented insuperable problems of reliability, power consumption, and speed. And in fact, it was very shortly after the invention of the transistor that the, the first uh, computers using transistors were developed. They, uh, they leapt on it straight away. Um, and, and of course, as, as we all know, um, we, we would not have our desktop computers. I would not be speaking to you now if we uh, hadn't got the uh, transistor to, to think. It took until October of 1948 for the news of this revolutionary device to be noted in Britain by Wireless World. They said, working in Bell Telephone Laboratories, J. Bardeen and W.H. Uh, Brattain have developed a three electrode germanium crystal contact device known as the transistor. If satisfactory circuit techniques can be developed to meet the conditions of low input and high output impedance and positive feedback, and if signal to noise ratio is not unduly low, there would seem to be many applications in which transistors could usefully take the place of valves. Bell Telephone Laboratories have already constructed an experimental radio receiver with a power output of 25 milliwatts using transistors throughout, and have also demonstrated a repeater amplifier and an audio frequency oscillator. The DC power consumption is 0.1 of a watt, and the overall efficiency is 25%. So the research went on, the GEC research laboratories demonstrated its characteristics on an oscilloscope and showed experimental equipment embodying it a three-stage audio frequency amplifier with a gain of 6 dB and an input impedance of 1K was shown. Um, so we can, uh, let's go. Here we are. Here's some of these early transistors. And I love this. Uh, I love this picture. You can see some of them are pretty, uh, are pretty basic. Uh, as you can see, these are just embedded in, uh, in what, what looks as like resin um, to hold the whole thing uh, in, in place. Um, but it's a lovely collection of uh, very early transistors, including this really unusual one here. Um, and you can see this one is marked RCA. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, um, intriguing. The earliest commercial applications in hearing aids, these have been using miniature valves, but although which although remarkably small, still made considerable power demands and batteries had a short life. Bell Laboratories encouraged the use of transistors in hearing aids by waiving the royalties. And by 1952, a number of designs were on the market in America. These were more expensive than the valve units, but they had the advantage of lower running costs. But the first wider public demonstration of the advantages of the transistor came in 1954 with the manufacture in America of a miniature transistor radio, the Regency Tree TR9, uh, TR1, sorry, which used four point contact transistors made by Texas Instruments. And here you see the interior, very compact device with tiny uh, IF transformers, uh, really packed in, because of the limited frequency response of the transistors at that time, the two stages of IF operated at a low frequency of 232 kilohertz. Uh, at 50, about $50, it wasn't cheap and it had an indifferent performance, but thousands were sold and very soon there were other manufacturers coming in on the act. I should say we didn't see these in this country. Um, they seem to be very much uh, an American uh, product. Um, there's the circuit diagram. Uh, pretty straightforward um, tuning. Uh, we're, we're using a ferrite rod aerial, of course, plastic case, so there's no screening for the, uh, for the ferrite rod. And uh, we're feeding signal in here. This is the oscillator section. Uh, so it's all being done in the first transistor. Um, and it's fed through into the first IF, into the second IF, and into the third IF, three stages um, of uh, IF um, 
transformers, a diode for uh, demodulation and volume control and into the output uh, transistor. So uh, a pretty simple affair, um, but it obviously worked. NPN transistors rather than PNP? Um, I think so, yes. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, it uh, could well be NPNs. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, let me think NPNs. Um, uh, I'll have a think about that. <laughs> I should have the answer, shouldn't I? Um, in this country, uh, the first radio that went onto the market uh, was the, the PAM, the PAM, uh, radio and this went on it was manufactured by Pi in 1956. It's very interesting that Pi manufactured this but they weren't ready to put their name on it uh, and it's uh, I think they were slightly worried that it wasn't going to succeed or at least that's the that's the story we we hear um, that it wasn't going to succeed so they uh, they disguised it uh, and uh, had a, a manufacturer called PAM to to uh, pr produce the first one um, and uh, it worked very well it had a nice large speaker um, it wasn't small um, and it wasn't as successful as the Regency TR1 but improved designs soon followed and the battery hungry miniature valve portables that had dominated the post-war market for, for over a decade ceased to be made and it was almost as if they turned a switch and uh, and stopped manufacturing these uh, the, the valve portables and here's the inside of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the of the pam uh, there we are uh, a reasonably traditional design. The, the the I don't think this is a printed circuit. It's actually a Paxilin uh, 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 board um, with uh, with wiring on the other side. Um, so all pretty conventional. What's amazing about some of these Pi, these early Pi radios, and I've got a, a quite a few of them. Um, you put a battery in them, and they actually work um, after all these years. It's just quite astonishing and. Uh, uh, so I'm continually surprised at how uh, how well they uh, have survived. Um, and there's one of the Pi transistors. Um, my understanding is that Pi were actually making the transistors as well, um, but there's a, a it's difficult finding the, uh, the 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 really clear truth on many of these uh, these ideas. But uh, there we are, Pi transistors. Um, this is the Bush uh, uh, TR82, and it's a very familiar, I'm sure, familiar to many people. This is a, a, a traditional design um, uh, that uh, that was has been made and is still being made in in, uh, in various forms. Um, a, a classic design, but it was first manufactured as a, a valve radio, and there we uh, of that. Um, as a valve radio with uh, um, a, a, a power supply in it, a mains power supply in it, as well as room at the bottom for the batteries. So uh, it was mains or battery. Um, but very shortly after they started manufacturing this, uh, they uh, the transistor came along. So they kept the same case and, uh, and filled it with a transistor set. And there we are, the same case, um, and the same push buttons here. Um, a slight rearrangement of everything. And I love it, these tiny little transistors sitting there where you, you sort of feel that valves should be taking up the space. And there are um, little, uh, I think they're little Mullard transistors uh, um, uh, doing, doing the job. Uh, so uh, a nice one to see. And of course, these uh, a, a chunky, uh, a chunky battery in just there. Um, of course, Many of the, the batteries were still being made by EverReady and EverReady were producing, uh, producing the uh, radios as well. So Sky Leader is one of theirs, uh, manufactured in large quantities and in various uh, um, shapes and sizes. And uh, there's the interior, an aluminium chassis. Um, so again, tag strip wiring and uh, a slightly later version of this, they started using a printed circuit. And you can see the output transistors just here, a pair of output transistors. 
uh, into the output transformer and a, a transformer, an input transformer as well. So a, a, a quality product. And uh, well, were the um, were, were the transistors uh, uh, germanium at this stage, or had they switched to silicon? No, these were these were point contact germanium transistors. Okay. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, it's remarkable how well they go on working. Uh, I, I I should say so. I like the dog, by the way. How nice. <laughs> um, right. Let's have a look. Um, uh, there are some people who said that life was just fine before transistors, uh, which, I, which I think is rather a nice observation. And I can just uh, show him a bit more clearly. There we are. Uh, life was just fine before transistors. Um, and there was a certain amount of resistance. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, or you're all set up with valves, um, there's going to be resistance to change. Um, and uh, we might ask what was happening in the amateur radio world when the where the valve was king, and in the aftermath of war, the radio shacks of the United Kingdom were brimming with high quality, high voltage ex-military equipment. The Admiralty, for instance, had been selling off electronic scrap at 50 shillings uh, per hundredweight. Um, and uh, so this is one example, of course, of uh, as a slightly more upmarket uh, set. I think this, uh, the AR88, was uh, one of those uh, receivers that, uh, that was, was highly desirable in the, in the post-war period. And of course, we had the R1155 combination and the, uh, the, the number 19 set, um, which uh, all did, did service in many radio shacks, of course, uh, amateur radio shacks um, for, for really for some while. Much of the surplus scrap uh, also came from the Army and Air Force, often in the form of brand new transmitters and receivers and test equipment. And right through into the 1960s, ex-military equipment was still readily available. What was the radio amateur to make of the three short paragraphs in the shortwave magazine of February 53, entitled Coming, the Era of Transistors, where the following observation was made. It is widely held that the coming developments in the application of transistors will revolutionize the science of electronics, particularly in the field of computer design and is where lightweight, minimum power requirements and simplified construction are of prime importance. But how could this tiny low voltage device ever handle the power needed for a transmitter? This would have been the key radio amateur question. Years of research had perfected the thermionic valve in many sophisticated forms. There was almost certainly some resistance to thinking that this tiny newcomer could ever replace the refined hardware, the familiar world of boat anchor radios, where amateurs needed muscle as well as an understanding of uh, electronics. Now, some of the first transistor transmitters. Uh, the report of the first transmitter came from the USA in January of 1953. Um, it was published in the QST magazine, not this one, but uh, the QST, although no exact date seems to have been recorded. So it must have actually been late in, 19, uh, in 1952. Um, and uh, this, this said that one evening, not long ago, K2AH George Rose, who you see here, of Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, worked WTKNI Mountainside with what was the first amateur transmitter, uh, transistor transmitter and probably the world's record for low transistor power. And I can just put the circuit diagram. This is a pretty basic transmitter. It's essentially an oscillator, as you can see, um, and uh, crystal controlled at 146 megs. So uh, with uh, a reasonably high voltage battery, uh, but a very simple uh, design. But what makes the American transmission of particular interest is that it, it was over a miles on a frequency of 146 
hertz at a time in 1953 when transistors were not generally available to work at such high frequencies. However, it would seem that George Rose, K2AH, was well placed because he was the advanced developments manager at RCA, where they had produced some special transistors that would oscillate at up to 300 megahertz. Also, he was using a two meter, 12 element beam. So it was possible to get considerable gain on the estimated 30 to 50 microwatts output from the single transistor crystal controlled Culpitz oscillator. It's interesting that in England, um, we were less than 12 months behind and a very similar uh, circuit diagram, as you can see, a little oscillator. Um, in the shortwave magazine for December of 1953, came news of a tiny transistor transmitter. Working from first principles and using a circuit diagram of his own de design, G5CV of God Godalming in Surrey has succeeded in working telephony uh, on 3608 kilohertz. So that was in the 80 meter band with a transmitter using only a single transistor. It runs at an input of 0.2 of a watt with power from a two and a half volt, 22 and a half volt deaf aid battery. It's believed to be the first time phone has been possible with a transistor oscillator and reports on the signal from any distance are particularly requested by G5CV. It's intriguing. Uh, these don't show what circuit he used for his uh, his phone transmitter. Um, I, I'd love to see them. It, it's, uh, it's an intriguing uh, thought. But anyway, uh, G5CV was Douglas Walters, and I've, I've been looking him up. Um, Douglas Waters uh, had built a five transmitter built in 1931, uh, and it was used in air to ground experiments in 1933. And here it is. Um, that's uh, that's it actually in the uh, in the Science Museum. It's part of the Science Museum collection. And we also have an image of G five CV's shack which is a joy to behold. Um, I just love this picture. It's just wonderful. I love the way it says danger. <laughs> it looks very much as if it is. And I'm just wondering whether he's got a, a presumably a motor and a generator here to produce uh, 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 power. And presumably you can sit with your feet on those and uh, to, to keep your feet warm. Um, and there seems to be a very large valve just here. Um, the, the whole place looks like a death trap, but uh, absolutely wonderful. And I've even uh, found some, uh, a couple of uh, QSL cards. This is obviously an earlier QSL cards, um, a 14 meg uh, report there. And this is a more recent one or was a more recent one. Um, and a month later, there was news of another transistor transmitter. And this was someone in Leicester. Um, he's uh, had it on the air for the past four months on the on the 1.7 megahertz band. So he was on the, the uh, top band. Um, <laughs> now, anyone who's uh, taken a listen to top band recently will know it's one, <laughs> it's a pretty noisy band. Um, and it must have been wonderful there back then, because I'm sure there was uh, far less noise. But he had a five transistor transmitter using GET ones. Um, that's uh, General Electric uh, uh, Telephones, one, um, with which he is working local CW. And uh, uh, I also found that he was preparing a lecture, Transistors and Their Applications to Amateur Radio for the Leicester Radio Society. Um, and G3CAA was uh, C.L. Wright, and he gave le lectures to Leicester Radio Society in 1964 on microwaves and in 1965 on parametric amplifiers in the VHF UHF bands. So he was a, a keen experimenter as well. It was noted at the time that the cost of a commercially made transistor was high. The only English one available to the public was the GET1, which uh, G3, G3CAA, CCA used. Um, and that would cost three pounds and the delivery was about two months. And RCA transistors were priced at six pounds to 12 pounds, according to type. And they even required a license to import. 
So, um, and I think we can see a picture of those RCA transistors. There we are. Um, wonderful. Can you imagine spending your hard earned six pounds or 12 pounds in getting something looking like that? You'd wonder if you'd uh, been taken for a ride, but I'm sure the, uh, the, the commercial productions were, uh, was a, were a bit smarter. The high price of transistors in 1954 is underlined by a report about the new germanium transistor, the GET2, manufactured by General Electric, which was priced at 37 and sixpence. Um, and I think we've got a picture of that. There we are, little top hat jobs, uh, uh, GEC uh, jobs. Um, I think they're wonderful. The uh, point contact transistor was in essence a simple device and one that we use at home, um, as shown in, the, in one of the Bernard's radio manuals published in 1954 in which the author, J.S. Kendall, offered detailed instructions. And it is possible to, to make transistors um, of the point contact variety, but uh, it's uh, not, uh, not terribly easy. Um, in June of 1963, the status of the transistor was summed up in an editorial in Practical Wireless, headed The Transistor Revolution. One major development in recent years was, of course, the reappearance of the semiconductor device in the guise of the transistor. At first, many people were highly skeptical about the transistor, considering it an interesting but limited innovation. And for a while, it did appear that so far as the radio amateur was concerned, the new device was intended was indeed strictly limited, being suitable only for pocket portables and similar pieces of equipment, where the criterion was simply that of miniaturization. But things moved on. The laboratories produced bigger and better transmitters, uh, transistors, types that could operate on the shortwave bands, and later types suitable for use in VHF receivers. And all the time, the power ratings were pushed up. Whatever reservations may have once existed, the semiconductor now looks all set to win its battle, not only for recognition, but for supremacy. One of the first transistor shortwave receivers aimed at the amateur market was the Heathkit Mohican GC1A, which was introduced in 1962. It was a good looking design that came of course in kit form. There were 10 PNP tran uh, germanium transistors in a super het circuit with a BFO and three stages of IF amplification. And this was followed uh, a couple of years later by the Edison 10 in 1964 from a famous company that had a long history of manufacturing valve radios. Now, I'm sure I'm telling you <laughs> I'm telling you a lot of you things you you absolutely know because I I'm sure um, I'm sure you've uh, a lot of you have uh, have come across the the EC10. Um, I've actually got three of them in my workshop, so uh, uh, which are more or less in uh, working order, um, much to my surprise. One of them having been uh, uh, dunked in the sea at one time, and it still uh, it still works. Um, and here's uh, just a section of the circuit board in uh, an EC10. Uh, we're getting pretty modern um, with uh, a printed circuit, of course, in, in this uh, particular one. The, um, the EC10, of course, was well known for their flywheel tuning arrangements. Uh, and they were also heavy. The EC10, however, was a scaled down version in both weight and size which has helped, was helped by the use of transistors. In amateur radio equipment, valves gradually gave, away, gave way to transistors as the latter improved and sophisticated in variations, including field effect transistors and integrated circuits became available. In 1970, the Yesu FT101 series of transceivers entered the market. Uh, and I think this must be the most famous uh, and uh, long lived design of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of transceivers. Um, they were entirely solid state, apart from the driver and the finals, which at the time needed to be valves to handle the transmitter power. Um, someone suggested the other day that they were, it wasn't solid state uh, finals, uh, but hollow state, which I think is a rather nice description for a valve. 
Um, it was a design that was steadily improved with valves in the finals. And uh, I couldn't resist a, a picture of the interior of this uh, lovely piece of equipment, both mechanically sound and electronically uh, uh, superb. And it was a design that was steadily improved over more than a decade, but always with valves in the in the finals. So um, uh, anyone who's got one of these will uh, will know all about loving it up because uh, they are very tasty bits of kit. And there we are. Um, the six uh, six one four sixes in the uh, in the final. Um, this is the FRG seven, the Frog seven, as they're called, uh, also from the Yezu stable in nineteen seventy six. Uh, communications receiver, a solid state triple conversion super, which the uh, the Hello, Wadley Loop, which uh, which I always uh, always amuses me, but it was used in a lot of uh, pieces of equipment. The RA17, for instance, uh, which was a valve set, used the uh, Wadley Loop as well, but uh, which gave considerable stability to the uh, to the uh, uh, equipment. And here's the interior of the uh, FRB7. Um, uh, well, um, uh, yes plenty of uh, miniature components. And I always think that this is important to remember that uh, once the transistor had been uh, developed, um, it was important to get the size of all the related components down. Um, and uh, th there must have been considerable um, work throughout the electronics industry to produce smaller and smaller components. And of course, all the time, smaller and such like in circuit is uh, is with so this is um this is the state of things today uh, there was undoubtedly within the amateur radio fraternity a deep resistance to abandoning the use of valves although the major manufacturers of amateur equipment were not slow in realizing the advantage Duncan, can can you hear me? CQ, CQ. Ah. There we go. Hi, Duncan. Are you, are you there, Duncan? Uh, yes, I'm here. I, I'm sorry. It just everything dropped out. Uh, I I don't have the uh, security of. Uh, uh, of, we're in the sticks here, you know, on the board. Yes, I, I, I thought that might be the case. So, uh, yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah, please carry on and uh, we can hear you again. So let's hope uh, the bandwidth well, folds out. I, I do apologise. In fact, I just had... Not at all, no, it's not your fault, so no problem. <laughs> Okay, well, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I, I just showed a, a, a series of uh, images of the 7300, which uh, um, well, the, the, the whole world and his wife seems to, uh, to have. Um, and, and I do feel that modern equipment is, is so very seductive with the touch screens and, and the colored screens. Uh, it, it really is, it's, it's really quite delicious. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if I acquire a 7300 at one point in the future. Um, but at the moment, I, 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 I'm a bit menu resistant, I must admit. Um, I, I do find it frustrating that uh, menus um, are, aren't necessarily designed. Yeah, it dropped, unfortunately. I'm just having an emergency Jaffa cake this end to see if that will help. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully. What's the uh, megabits per second rating of a Jaffa cake then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a shame because there's some beautiful uh, pictures that are coming from uh, Duncan's presentation there, but um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get him back well enough to support the uh, video feed. 
So the answer to the megabits on the Jaffa cake is that um, all matter can be represented as information, and information has an energy cost. So you turn the amount of matter into in the amount of information using your standard quantum mechanical equations. You now have a quantity of energy. You then measure how long it takes to um, eat the cake, and now you've got the bandwidth of the cake. Um, so there's a solution for you. There are some, by the way, that say that Jaffa cakes are actually biscuits. Just want to throw that in there. Well, there, there was a whole there was a whole VAT thing that actually went to court because at one stage uh, cakes were regarded as as um, I think biscuits were luxury items and cakes weren't, and the customs excise were ruling that VAT should be payable because it's actually a biscuit, um, but they successfully proved that it was a cake because. Um, biscuits go soggy with age, but cakes actually go hard and brittle with age. And they did a test of the Jaffa cake, and sure enough, it went hard and brittle with age, and therefore was a cake, and, and therefore sorry, was exempt David. from VAT. <laughs> That's brilliant. I can see Duncan has rejoined. I have rejoined, yes. Hello. It, I've obviously got the disastrous connection to, uh, tonight. Sometimes it just, uh, just doesn't... Uh, doesn't work so um so i do do apologize but uh, things beyond my control uh, anyway look, I, I i won't i won't prolong the agony um uh, is all i can say is that um that i hope that's been some of some interest on the uh, on the whole subject of of transistors and and the way in which they were introduced um from a, a, an improbable uh, beginner it, it has become um, the the device that uh, dominates uh, the the world. I mean, it has had it's a revolution. I mean, Gutenberg and the and the the, the invention of printing has got nothing on the transistor and uh, and what came came out of it. Um, it really is quite astonishing. Um, and uh, it, I find it makes me it makes me rather cross when I come across people who 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 don't realise um, what they're holding in their hand is is a uh, their little uh, uh, little gadget with a screen with a touch screen is is a positive miracle of uh, of um, uh, brilliance uh, the, the the work of so many very very clever people. Um, that uh, that it, it makes me cross that people don't actually realise uh, how lucky they are to have um, have that available, um, and so we've been talking about analog sets, of course, and uh, and uh, and of course now the the whole business of amateur radio is dominated by digital. Um, digital has swept in, and uh, if you if you can't uh, program a um do a little bit of programming you're out on a out on a limb these days i feel um and uh, the the interesting thing is that uh, i i've got a, a number of dab sets in 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 my house little digital radios for broadcast uh, stuff um but uh, the the trouble with them is uh, they're very battery hungry have you noticed um unless they're plugged into the mains um, the, the, the batteries don't last long, um, and I and I feel in a way this it's been a, a something of a retrograde step, um, and uh, uh, I've been also thinking about the situation in Russia at the moment, and just hoping that uh, a lot of Russian people have kept hold of their um, beautifully made Russian analog radios, particularly the shortwave ones. Because that's going to be the only way they're going to <laughs> going to get uh, some uh, some sensible news at the moment. Um, so fascinating. All these changes are really quite fascinating. So uh, anyway, I will stop now before <laughs> before my uh, connection fails yet again. But uh, I hope that's been uh, of, of some interest. Yes. Well, um, first of all, um, a big thank you uh, very much indeed for a fascinating talk. Um, a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that the um, 
the connection held out because as I say to so many people that are kind enough to give us presentations, but I have the need to say it again tonight, beautiful photography and pictures in that presentation, which were great. Uh, I certainly enjoyed seeing in the back of all those different sets. So it was great to see those. And thank you very much. Um, if, if you're happy maybe to do some questions, what's been suggested is that if you just turn off your video, but not your audio, um, we might be able to stay in contact to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, field some questions if you would be kind enough to, uh, to do that. That's fine, yes. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll start off um, in the room here and see if there's any questions from the floor. Any questions here, Barry? Um, Duncan, I have an observation for you. Um, my father um, was part of a, uh, in, as part of a, um, he was an electrical retailer in London. And he ended up buying a business um, in the 60s, I think, um, uh, which was called Perkins Electrical. And the reason why the Perkins Electrical was in electronics and stuff was because the company started out selling bicycles. And bicycles eventually had lights, which needed batteries. So the cycle shop was where you got your batteries from. And then when the radios came along, the cycle shops sold the radios because they had the batteries you need. And that's the, and that's the sequence. Um, the other way that that group of companies and had a very entrepreneurial um, owners, um, they also went from bicycles into motor cars. So there's still an existing Perkins motor cars business, but the electrical business doesn't exist anymore. Um, that finally mm -hmm. closed about 10 years ago. My father finally retired about 85. Um, but uh, God, did we sell a lot of batteries. <laughs> and charge the accumulators, G3XYX. Yes, I, I was just, I was thinking about the accumulators and I was investigating a, a house in a little village called Webley in uh, Herefordshire and uh, I was looking at the cellar which uh, <coughs> proved to be uh, 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 an extraordinary cellar because it was, I think it was about, uh, it was 15th century in date and it had 15th century floorboards uh, in, in the ceiling, but screwed to one side of the cellar was uh, a, a, a transformer and a rectifier um, for charging accumulators, which they had been doing for, for many years. Um, I didn't dare turn it on. It wasn't in, uh, clearly wasn't in working order. But uh, yeah, they, they, the accumulators were glass, uh, in glass cases weren't they they were sort of yeah you could see you could see readily see the level of the liquid in the in the accumulators uh, quite fascinating um, and i love that uh, that idea of, uh, of a retailer moving from uh, um, through that sequence uh, into selling cars uh, and of course we must uh, we must recall the the wright brothers they started by uh, making bicycles and look where they ended up um, taking taking to the air so uh, um, it, it can go in uh, in various ways rural communities not on mains are very very important and uh, uh, usually the household would have two accumulators, one resident with a local cycle shop or garage to be charged and the other one in use, and they'll be swapped over once every couple of weeks, depending on listening hours. It's lovely. It's uh, it's an, it's another word. It's quite a quite a thought. But of course, we're all we're all still doing it. You know, I mean, uh, uh, we we everyone has a, a whole network of wires which are charging up this and that device. Uh, the, um, we're sort of back in the accumulator world, um, but, but it's become very, uh, very miniature, miniaturized. And I see you have a dab radio behind you. Can I go back to transistors for a moment, Duncan? This is Robin, G4IWS. The, um, 
one thing that impressed me when I first started working with transistors at work was that we made a, a very simple flip-flop from germanium transistors and um, just two transistors at a capacitor and a couple of two capacitors, two resistors. And um, to my utter amazement, this thing still behaved in exactly the same way, apart from its output voltage, when you turned it down to 200 millivolts of supply. And I thought this was absolutely magic for to have something after my upbringing with valves. It, something that actually worked at 200 millivolts was absolutely amazing. It is, it is interesting that, that, that the whole thing of miniaturization, both physical miniaturization, but a, a miniaturization of the, of the, the power, the voltage, uh, it, it has been one of the keys, hasn't it? I, um, I, you can cram very, very narrow um, uh, lines in your circuit board um, because your voltages and your currents are so very low. And, uh, um, and that's one of the secrets, isn't it? Um, the, the low voltage and uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's a really significant aspect of the whole business of transistors. But how nice having a flip-flop. <laughs> did you, did you what, what were you using it for? Well, it was part of a, an equipment design which ran off five volts. And one day something went wrong or then I'm exploring this thing and I was testing it with a, a multimeter which obviously delivered 200 millivolts to the circuit and to my utter, utter amazement the thing started oscillating when I connected a digital voltmeter to it. Oh right, I see, yes. <laughs> but Duncan, uh, obviously the, you know, the first radius of germanium as, as uh, Robin indicates, you know, they, they operate with low junction voltages and so um, you could have low battery voltages and so quite efficient. But at some point there must have been a switch to silicon. Do, do you know roughly when that happened? I, th I think it was quite early, but, but the difficulty was, I think the difficulty was the production actually getting the purity of the silicon for, for, a, for a start. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I'm hesitant about, um, uh, about saying anything about the whole business of, uh, of transistor manufacture because it is incredibly complicated and uh, uh, and the I, I'm astonished at how um, how brilliant the research has been um, and the number of papers that were written on the subject uh, right at the beginning you know the, the, virtually when the transistor was first devised um, People started experimenting, and uh, uh, you, you were getting 500, um, 500 papers written per year and more in the second year. And I mean, it, it was a really exponential um, growth of, of uh, research. And obviously, it was driven by economics. It was it, it was seen as um, uh, as, a, as a winner and. Uh, particularly in terms of computers, of course, yeah, because of the switching speed. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've kind of reaching the end of, of, um, of, of Moore's law, um, it, or it's or rather it's slowing down just, just due to physical constraints, you know, make it too small, you have quantum tunneling, um, and then you've got the um, heat density that you've got to dissipate. So as you go the, up the switching speed, you've got to get rid of the heat. And, um, you know, it used to be that your um, companies would replace laptops every three years because by that stage um, they'd been vastly superseded by uh, superior products and and now companies are actually perhaps only refreshing laptops every five years because the, the 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 pace of um, performance improvement it, of, of course is is now starting to uh, to flatten out a bit so now one wonders what the future is going to hold there so I, I do agree. I, I think it is it is fascinating to to speculate on uh, uh, on on where it's all going. Um, uh, it's uh, 
it's very it's a very exciting subject i i mean it's it's so strange because uh, i i kind of left the subject of electronics when i was about uh, uh, 20 <laughs> and uh, I, although i kept an i've kept an eye on what was going on nevertheless um coming back to it at a relatively late uh, stage in my life um i've been a, been amazed at uh, at, at uh, the the yeah. development very and i think and I think the people that initially sort of thought the transistors were only going to be lower power devices would be absolutely shocked. Um, you know, the, the AC to DC converters that happen, I think, on the cross channel um, electricity link, um, all of that solid state. You think how many, how many thousands of amps that you've got rectifiers there operating at all, all solid state. Uh, unbelievable. It's astonishing. Local uh, amateurs who try and use 160 meters know all about it. <laughs> do Do you have much? Uh, do you have much, many problems with noise in in your your area with uh, with various bands? Uh, I, I'm very lucky because I really, you know, there's a there's a farming there's there's fields around my house. <laughs> And uh, very little else, um, which, which is which is wonderful. And I I, I find that when we have um, when we have a, a club net, um, I'm the one who can hear everybody, and uh, there's always somebody who who doesn't uh, doesn't can't hear anything. Um, it's uh, do you have that? Is that a major problem with uh, the Reading area? Yes. PXYX at night, but um, during the day, 80 meters is reasonable, and I have to have a separate receiving aerial. Right, yes. I, I think it depends where, where, whereabouts you are in Reading, Duncan. I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm in a kind of uh, small village, and I've just got a field behind me, a field in front of me, and I do have neighbors either side, but the noise levels are still comparatively low um but i think you know i'm not in a built-up area it's, it's a kind of semi-rural uh, uh somewhat like yourself but i think those those people are on on large housing estates um you you've got just such a high density of people and their electronic devices i i, I don't see how you can escape it yes you're you're right and in, and in fact i've only got to walk around my house with a with a little uh, a little radio tuned to uh, to medium wave and uh, it there's noise from all sorts of gadgets in 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 my house and uh, you know the, the the toothbrush the little toothbrush sitting there on its charger yeah yeah i mean uh, um i I've, I've been trying to avoid led lighting um for for that reason but in fact i i i i switched back to led lighting but i made up a whole series of filters to put on, and I, I chose a, a well-known branded bulb because I've had some very bad experiences with some of the the kind of Chinese imports that probably, although they're CE marked, probably aren't CE tested. Mm -hmm. So um, I've um, I, I think LED lighting is is still a big problem. Yes, yeah, so those yes. toothbrushes. I I've had issues with those because they seem to. It's pulses up on two meters. I've had with those recharging toothbrushes. Yeah, I had to go and disconnect them if I wanted to use two meters. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, on the other end of the band, uh, uh, top band, top band being my favourite band, I think really. But uh, top band is absolutely awful here during the daytime. But recently we had a power cut. We're in a, just outside of Major Town, so we had a power cut. Forty-eight hours we were off, and top band was lovely. I could actually hear things I couldn't normally hear, but normally. Yeah. Yeah. If this this toothbrush doesn't produce any interference. <laughs> yes, I saw you waving that all while. I, yeah. I will say that on in terms of interference on HF, um, where lots of people suffer from VDSL interference, you know, broadband, uh, as I did, uh, I do still slightly, but my um, you know broadband gets put into people's homes. And it has to accept the wiring as is. And we had a number of extensions and we had all the uh, new broadband filters put on all the different sockets. And the uh, master box above the door was years old. And it was all 
well, it, it was obviously noisy. And eventually the whole system became so slow that we, and we up, this is BT, we upgraded to whatever it was. Um, Infinity. No, 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 no. This is um, uh, something free. Anyway, um, he came in and he looked at all it. He said, I'm going to put in a proper open reach box with the own with its own filters in. You have one line goes out to your broadband, the other line goes to I all think it's phones. I think it's called uh, an MTE5 master socket. Yeah, thing. that's the one. And, and and he replaced the uh, cable up to the side of the house where it met the stuff off the telephone pole and it was all cleared. And it's because yeah. the original yeah. wiring, you know, was years old. And I think you'll find that at most people's houses, you know, have got wiring of different ages is not balanced. And, and if everybody had brand new open reach boxes you know that as you described Dave it would be a lot lot better yeah I can't wait until five to the premises available but I, I keep looking on BT's website and they're saying um current they can't tell any dates certainly it's not going to be in the next um, 12 months because I think once we're all fiber to the premises I, I think a, a lot of that sort of issue will disappear well as we so speak, as we speak city fiber are doing this area uh, they've already yeah. done my street. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sad, sadly, the only ISP I can go with is Vodafone, which is absolute junk. Um, but um, I approached Andrews and Arnold, which is a far better ISP, and they said they're not doing city fibre, but to watch their website over the next couple of weeks because OpenReach is doing something in my area with fibre to the home. Yeah. So, so the, the, the fight, the, as, as you said, Dave, um, getting rid of the wires and going for fiber optic is going to get our noise problem under control. Yeah. And it, 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 it's happening right now. That's good to know. I seem to have the problem then that I was told I'd get fiber to the home from the exchange and all that kind of thing, right up to the box in the, on the pavement. And, um, then I discovered that it hadn't actually happened. And they said, oh, well, no, you're too near the exchange. So, <laughs> uh, so I've still got my wire. Everything else, is, I mean, it works very well. I get 50 megs, but the it's still the wire. And that the problem is my wire is under the road surface, no problem. But the road at the back is still on poles. And they're near the exchange still, so they won't have fibre. So uh, I'm just praying that they'll tear it all down and put fibre underground. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, being offered, I'm being offered 900 meg symmetric um, on city fibre. 900 meg symmetric. They won't go to a gig. And they, and they promise to never go below those 600 megs. Symmetric. Both ways. Yeah. Because we don't really need those speeds domestically. It's... Well, for television, you speak, do. speak for yourself. Well, OK. <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> to me, it's not speed. It's just reliability. And uh, yeah. as you've seen this evening, you know, that uh, uh, it's, it's very frustrating uh, when, it, when it drops out. Well, I'd be perfectly happy with my 40 megs noise free, absolutely noise free. Could be would be fine. We still get TV off air. Mm. Yeah. Now, how we, much longer? We, I don't know. <laughs> we run between 55 and 60 and it's, it, it does seem very reliable, really, I must admit. Uh, just going to jump in and see if anyone else has got any, any specific questions about the about the talk. Uh, John is sitting next to me and says he has one. Yeah, so Duncan, are you actually a collector of uh, transistors? Because there was quite an impressive display of uh, transistors throughout the talk. Yes, oh, I, I must admit I have been, um, have been gathering them, much to my wife's dismay. Um, well, at least they're not very big. <laughs> at least they're not very big, I do, I do agree. I do have, a, I do have a, a very big collection of 
uh, early typewriters, which I've been collecting for years. So uh, those are, those do take up a lot of space, and and they're also very heavy. Um, I think that I think my current my current uh, my current uh, a typewriter collection is is there are about 250 machines so it's oh. um it's i oh know it's very oh. serious it's very serious <laughs> um, but uh, no these these little radios i've been i've been i've been looking at the, some of the earliest ones and looking at the the techniques that are used um and i i've been i've been buying really um not buying collectors, collectors examples because they tend to be expensive. People, you know, like him, like them to be in really good condition. Uh, to me, the condition hasn't mattered so much as whether all the original components are there and whether they can tell the tale. Um, so, so that that's been a, an interesting little study and looking yeah. at the transition from valves to transistors at, at that in in the 50s and into the 60s yeah. and then of course the development the, the way in which um, at a certain point transistors begin to vanish as discrete components and uh, and we start getting um, we, we well we, we get more than one transistor in the in the container uh, to put it simply um, and uh, and I find that's fascinating as well, um, and it's it's just that astonishing um, way in which things develop, yes. and 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 it's brilliant ideas coming in all the time. Yeah. You might be interested, Duncan, that um, we we did we we were involved in um, Jamboree on the air last year, and we we got some young scouts building some radio kits, and these were um, FM broadcast receivers. But essentially, um, it was just one integrated circuit, mm. and then a bunch of R's and C's around that, um, plus a crystal. Um, but effectively, it was a complete FM receiver on a single chip. Yes, so, I've, uh, I, yeah. I, I do. Ha I do have one of those, um, I, which was built from a from a kit, and uh, really, really fascinating, and uh, yeah. so, so minimal, um, uh, amazing. Um, yeah. When I joined the old Beeb, um, they were in the act of looking at transistors and they published a monograph. And the general consensus within the conclusions of this monograph were that transistors were quite interesting and would be suitable for things like talkback and um, internal communications of various kinds, but they'd never be good enough for the high quality audio that the BBC expected. <laughs> and that was 1963-ish. Oh, wow. Yes. And that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed. <laughs> because I was working as a dubbing assistant and caught some of the first, ge first generation transistorized equipment. And I can remember trying to line up 16 and 35 mil recording machines where the bias just drifted about all over the place. They were a nightmare to keep in spec. And also uh, the dubbing mixer was limited in how many pots he could open at the same time without the noise building up. Second generation were totally different, a lot more reliable, and they came in like little building boxes. Um, but the first generation uh, were awful. G3, X, Y, X. I think I think it's 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 interesting that um, the the way in which amateur radio has moved though it is much more difficult to make pieces of equipment now it's much more a matter of putting modules together um, r rather than uh, rather than getting the soldering iron out and uh, working with components that you can see easily. Yeah. Um, the miniaturization is admirable, but it does uh, it does militate to a certain extent against uh, uh, home construction. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in, in kits, Duncan, I can highly recommend looking at the Elecraft website. Although it's a bit of a dated design, the Elecraft K2, with one exception, is all discrete uh, leaded components, and it's something that any amateur could actually if they work through it methodically, could actually build a, um, a an HF transceiver, um, you know, from essentially PCBs and bag of bits. 
Well, I, I actually do have a K2. Okay, yeah, well, you, I you didn't, want to... I didn't build it, I should say. It was yeah. built by a, um, one of our club members who's now Silent Key, but uh, yeah. he built it very well, and I love it. It works yeah. beautifully. Uh, and yeah. it, it's completely... They're, they're, they're still available. The challenge for Aircraft, of course, is, is can they still, steep, still get some of the leading components? Uh, because they, they use... Um, Oh, I think it's an SA516. It's, it's actually used as a mixer chip and it's getting increasingly different, difficult to get them as dual inline packages because of course they, everyone's gone surface mount these days. So I think that's going to be the challenge is has they got enough stock of the dual inline packages for the ICs um, to continue actually offering the kit. So. Yes, I'm obviously going to have to hope it never, go, never goes wrong. <laughs> But it's, uh, but it's a very good looking piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think that's something that, that also, you know, I do find interesting that, uh, you know, um, apart from the touch screens and the, the color screens on, on radios, they're all black these days, aren't they? Have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I do wonder sometimes whether it, uh, it's very interesting to look at some of the earlier designs. I showed a picture of the Mohican, for instance. Um, a, a really a, quite a classy piece of design. Um, and I've I've been looking at some of the American uh, the American transistor, the early American transistors um, transistor sets, and their design flair was absolutely superb. Really very exciting and. Uh, uh, and I sometimes wonder whether um, a little bit of uh, a bit of flair in terms of design would be a would be a wonderful thing in amateur radio. Yeah, I, I'm surprised at your collection of, of uh, wonderful photos, Duncan. You, you hadn't actually included any Japanese because, of course, the Japanese were leading the field here as well. Yes, it's interesting. They 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 had a a, a pretty slow start, but they soon got the hang of it. It was it was interesting, and they. Um, but uh, yeah, as you say, it's uh, it's interesting. Some of these uh, some of these early ones, uh, the collectors. Um, I mean, it's they, they 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 pay for serious money for some of these things. Um, uh, the the TR one that I showed you, um, I think they change hands for five hundred to a thousand pounds a piece, Ooh. which Ooh. is really astonishing. I mean, there's no yeah. way I'm going to be. Yeah. <laughs> However, I mean, the problem the, the problem with with old valve equipment used to be that you'd have to replace. Um, all of the electrolytics and probably many of the other capacitors, just ravages of age and high voltage. Um, when you get some of the older transistor sets, do you find you still have to, to do any capacitor replacement or, 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 or has the lower voltages been kind enough to them that they, they, they generally don't uh, fail in the same way? Yes, you're absolutely right. The, the, the lower voltages do help enormously. Um, but I'm always in favour of... Uh, of keeping as much of the original as possible and um i i'm to me i don't want it necessarily to work again <laughs> although it is nice um i i i do think uh, to keep it in its uh, its original state is uh, is um and i bring this into my uh, research on timber frame buildings i should add <laughs> i hate seeing um Hate seeing uh, inappropriate uh, uh, repairs and alterations to uh, historic buildings. So I treat uh, treat radios in the same way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm yeah, just going to come back with a quick four penis. Sorry, I'm three X wives. Don't be, wish to be negative. I was mentioning about the problems for the first generation of uh, transistorized equipment, and again out on the road using the EMIL2, which was a transistorized version of a valve recorder, which was very popular in its heyday. We're now talking 63. By 68, 69, the Kudelsky Nagra reel to reel recorder had come along. And the transformation in quality and reliability was breathtaking. And uh, I have my own personal one in 72, and that lasted over 25 years of being humped around the world and only broke down twice. 
So the quality and the improvement in technology over that period of time was just breathtaking. Anyway, I didn't wish to be negative about everything with a transistor in it. A very good evening to you and thank you from G3XYX. Um, I'm just going to jump in here to say um, we've got um, uh, the equipment to uh, pack up and various things here. So we're going to sort of call uh, a halt to the physical part of this meeting. But um, please do carry on with the Zoom. You're in the safe hands of uh, Tom there, I believe. He's got the um, hosting. So um, from the um, Scout Hut in uh, Woodley near Reading, uh, I would like to say a big thank you again um, to you, Duncan, to everyone else who's joined us tonight. And um, enjoy the rest of your evening and hope to see you again soon. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing people at the junk sale as well. So. Uh, 70 freeze from Woodley. That's marvellous. Thank you very much, Janet. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you for the Good, warm thank you. And uh, do join us again uh, sometime in the future. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Okay. I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Good night. All right. Thanks very much. 70 freeze, everyone.